Let's read the、uh, book by、uh, Sam Harris, "Waking Up: A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion." We know, of course, that human minds are the product of、uh, human brains. There is、uh, simply no question that、uh, your ability to decode and understand this sentence depends upon neural. Physiological events taking place inside your head at this moment, but、uh, most of this mental work occurs entirely in the dark, and it is a, a mystery why any part of the process should be attended by consciousness. Nothing about a brain, when surveyed as a, a physical system, suggests that、uh, it is a locus of.、Uh, Experience. Were we not already brimming with our consciousness ourselves? We would find no evidence for it in the universe. Nor would we have any portion of the many experiential states that it gives rise to. The only proof. That、uh, it is like something to be you at this moment is the fact, obviously only to you, that is、uh, like something to be you. However, we propose to explain the emergence of consciousness, be it、uh, in biological, functional, computational, or any other terms. We have、uh, committed ourselves to this much. First. There is a physical world, unconscious and seething with unperceived events. Then, by virtue of、uh, some physical property or process, consciousness itself springs or staggers into being. This idea seems to me not merely strange but、uh, perfectly mysterious. That、uh, doesn't mean it isn't true. When we linger over the details, however, this notion of emergence seems merely a placeholder for a miracle. Consciousness, the sheer fact that this universe is illuminated by sentience, is、uh, precisely what consciousness is not. And I believe that、uh, no description of a、uh, unconscious complexity will fully account for it. To simply assert that the consciousness arose at some point in the evolution of life, <coughs> and、uh, that it results from a specific arrangement of、uh, neurons firing in concert within an、uh, individual brain, doesn't give us any. Inkling of how it could emerge from、uh, unconscious processes, even in principle. However, this is not to say that some other thesis about、uh, consciousness must be true. Consciousness may very well be the lawful product of a consciousness information processing, but、uh, I don't know what that sentence actually means. And I don't think anyone else does either. This situation has been characterized as an explanation,、uh, explanatory gap, and、uh, as the hard problem of、uh, consciousness. And it is、uh, surely both. Some philosophers have、uh, suggested that the relationship between mind and the body will be understood only with.、Uh, Reference to concepts that are neither physical nor mental, but that、uh, are in some way neutral. Others、uh, claim that、uh, consciousness can be known to be the product of、uh, physical causes, but cannot be conceptually reduced to such causes. Still, others have、uh, argued that the notion of a non-re Deductive physical account is、uh, incoherent. I am、uh, sympathetic with those who, like the philosopher Colin McGinn and the psychologist Steven Pinker, have suggested that、uh, 
perhaps the emergence of a consciousness is simply incomprehensible in human terms. Every chain of explanation must end somewhere, generally with a, a brute fact that neglects to explain itself. Perhaps consciousness presents an impasse of this sort. In any case, the task of explaining consciousness in physical terms bears little resemblance to other successful explanation in the history of science. The analogies that the scientists and the philosophers marshal here are invariably misleading. The fact, for instance, that we can now describe the properties of a matter, such as a fluidity, in terms of uh, microscopic events that are not themselves fluid does not suggest a way to understand consciousness as uh, emergent properties of the unconscious world. It is easy to see that uh, no single water molecule can be fluid. And it is easy to see that uh, billions of such molecules freely sliding past one another would uh, appear as a fluidity, fluidity on the scale of a, a human hand. What is not easy to see is how analogies of this kind have uh, persuaded so many people that the consciousness can be readily explained in terms of information processing. For uh, explanation of a phenomena to be satisfying, it must first be, at a minimum, intelligible. In this regard, the emergence of a fluidity poses no problems. The free sliding of uh, molecules seems exactly the sort of thing that should be true of a substance to ensure its uh, fluidity. Why can I pass my hand through liquid water and not through a rock? Because the molecules of water are not bound so tightly as to resist my motion. Notice that uh, this explanation of fluidity is uh, perfectly reductive. Fluidity really is uh, nothing but the free motion of uh, molecules. For this explanation to be sufficient, we must admit that the molecules exist, of course. But once we do, the problem is solved. No one has described a set of uh, unconscious events whose uh, sufficiency as a cause of consciousness would make sense in this way. Any attempt to understand consciousness in terms of a brain activity merely correlates a person's ability to report uh, experience, demonstrating that he was aware of it, with the specific states of his brain. Well, such correlations can amount to fascinating neuroscience they bring us no closer to explaining the emergence of a consciousness itself. There will almost certainly some a time when we will build a robust, who's a, a, a build a robot, whose uh, facial expressiveness, tone of a voice, and the flexibility of a thought will cause us to wonder whether or not it is a conscious. This uh, robot might even claim to be conscious and uh, be eager to participate in the kinds of experiments we now perform on human beings, allowing us to correlate its uh, responses to stimuli with uh, changes in its brain. It seems clear, however, that uh, unless we can do more than this, we will never know whether there is uh, something that uh, it is like to be such a machine. Some readers may think that uh, I have uh, stacked the deck against the, con the sciences of the mind by comparing consciousness to a phenomena as e easily understood as uh, fluidity. Surely, science has uh, dispelled far greater mysteries. What, for instance, is the difference between a living system and a dead one? 
insofar as questions about consciousness itself can be kept off the table, it seems that uh, the difference is now reasonably clear to us. And yet, as late as uh, 1932, the Scottish physiologist G.S. Haldin, father of uh, G.B.S. Haldin, wrote, What intelligible account can be mechanistic theory of life give of the recovery from disease and injuries? Simply none at all, except that uh, these phenomena are so complex and strange that as yet we cannot understand them. It is uh, exactly the same with the closely related phenomena of uh, reproduction. We cannot be any stretch of the imagination, conceive a delicate and a complex mechanism which is uh, capable, like a living organism, of uh, reproducing itself indefinitely often. Scarcely 20 years passed before our imaginations were duly stretched. Much work in biology remains to be done, but uh, anyone who entertains vitalism at this point is similarly ignored about the nature of living systems. The jury is no longer out on questions of this kind, and uh, more than half a century has passed since the Earth's uh, creatures required a uh, elan vital to propagate themselves or to recover from injury. It's my skepticism that we will arrive at a physical explanation of consciousness analogous to Haldin's doubt about the feasibility of uh, explaining life in terms of uh, processes that are not themselves alive? It wouldn't seem so. To say that a system is alive is very much like saying that it is uh, fluid, because life is a matter of uh, what systems do with respect to their environment, like a fluidity. Life is defined according to external criteria. Consciousness is not, and I think cannot be. We would never have occasion to say of something that does not eat, excrete, grow, or reproduce that uh, it might be alive. It might, however, be conscious. Might a mature neuroscience nevertheless offer a proper explanation of uh, consciousness in terms of its uh, underlying brain processes? Again, there is nothing about a brain, studied at any skill, that even suggests that it might harbor consciousness, apart from the fact that we experience consciousness directly and have uh, correlated many of its uh, contents, or like thereof, with uh, processes in our brains. Nothing about uh, human behavior or language or culture demonstrates that uh, it is uh, meditated by consciousness, apart from the fact that uh, we simply know that it is a truth that someone can appreciate in himself directly and in others by analogy. Here is uh, where the distinction between studying consciousness itself and uh, studying its uh, contents becomes paramount. It is easy to see how the contents of uh, consciousness might be understood in neurophysiological terms. Consider, for instance, our experience of seeing an object, its color, contours, apparent motion, and uh, location in space arise in consciousness as a seamless unity. Even though this information is processed by many separate systems in the brain, thus when a golfer prepares to hit a shot, he does not first see the ball's roundness, then its whiteness, and only then its position on the tee. Rather, he enjoys a unified perception of the ball. Many neuroscientists believe that this phenomenon of bending can be explained by disparate groups of neurons faring in synchrony 
Whether or not this theory is true, it is at least intelligible, because uh, synchronous activity seems just the sort of thing that could explain the unity of a percept. This work suggests, as many other findings in neuroscience do, that the contents of uh, consciousness can often be made sense of in terms of uh, their underlying neurophysiology. However, when we ask why such a phenomenon should be experienced in the first place, we are returned to the mystery of uh, consciousness in full. Unfortunately, efforts to locate consciousness in the brain generally fail to distinguish between consciousness and its uh, contents. As a result, many researchers have taken one form of consciousness, or one class of its contents, as a sufficient view of the whole. For instance, Christoph Koch and others have done some very clever work on vision, looking for which regions of the brain encode conscious uh, visual perception. The phenomena of a binocular rivalry has uh, provided an especially useful foothold here. It just so happens that when each eye is uh, presented with a different visual stimulus, a person's conscious experience is not a blending of the two images, but rather a series of uh, apparently random transitions between them. If, for instance, you are shown a picture of a house in one eye and a human face in the other, you will not see the two images competing with each other or otherwise uh, superimposed. You will see the house for a few seconds, and then the face, and then the house again, switching at random intervals. This phenomenon has allowed experimenters to look for those regions of the brain in both humans and the monkeys that responds to a change in conscious um, perceptions. The uh, psychophysical situation seems tailor-made to distinguish the frontier between the conscious and unconscious components of a vision. Because uh, the input remains constant, each eye receives the continuous impression of a single image, while somewhere in the brain a uh, wholesale change in the contents of a consciousness occurs every few seconds. This is uh, very interesting, and yet uh, subjects experiencing binocular rivalry are conscious throughout the experiment. Only the contents of uh, visual awareness have been modulated by the task. If you shut your eyes at this moment, the contents of your consciousness change quite drastically, but your consciousness arguably does not. This is not to say that our understanding of the mind won't change in surprising ways through our study of the brain. There may be no limit to how a maturing neuroscience matter reshape our beliefs about the nature of a conscious experience. Are we unconscious during sleep or merely unable to remember what sleep is like? Can human minds be duplicated? Neuroscience may one day answer such questions, and the answers might well surprise us. But the reality of consciousness appears irreducible. Only consciousness can know itself and directly. Through first-person experience, it follows, therefore, the rigorous introspection, spirituality, in the widest sense of the term, is an uh, indispensable part of uh, understanding the nature of the mind. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, thank you for listening. If you like, please uh, give uh, a thumb up, uh, forward to your friend, and subscribe to this channel. Thanks. Bye-bye.